in our modern world we have access to most of the things that we want suppose you are wanting to grab a cup of steaming coffee chances are that you might visit a cafe to order and drink that or maybe you are wanting to have your favorite noodles either your parents might make it for you or you can go to a restaurant or even you can order it online so what we can understand from this is that we have access to different kinds of things we have huge or small houses to live in we have different kinds of vehicles to commute in we have different kinds of technologies and resources that make our lives so much easier so much more convenient and most importantly we have the internet with the benefit of internet you can be in touch with someone who resides in the farthest point of the world in just a minute so the things we take for granted are often not accessible to many people now just a while ago we saw a clip that introduced us to the lives of the tribals they live amidst nature and they cut trees they gather different kinds of forest produce that they consume as food they store water from whichever water source that's available near them now this is a kind of life that they used to live previously previously as in through the 16th 17th 18th centuries or even prior to that their lives have been very different from the lives that you and i live today but do you think they were compelled to live in that kind of way most definitely not because they fell at home amidst nature that was their normal way of living you might be thinking that it must have been very difficult for them to live in the forested regions but it was not so for them because they loved living in the forests their lives were radically different from the lives that mainstream societies have been witnessing and experiencing since ages now in this lesson we will be introduced to the tribals who lived in different parts of the indian subcontinent through the 16th 17th 18th centuries and here we will also be introduced to a certain group of people who were known as the dikus by the tribals so this lesson will be devoted to understanding the lives of the tribals as they lived it previously and who these dikus were in their lives so without wasting any time let us begin this lesson now the tribals lived outside or on the fringes of caste based mainstream societies the caste system that segregated the societies into four categories has been prevalent in the indian subcontinent since ages now the tribals were the ones who did not belong to this caste system that categorized the society among the brahmanas the kshatriyas the vaishyas and the shudras now where did these people live instead they lived outside or beyond the mainstream caste based societies these people led independent lives they lived mostly in the forested regions and they were free to move and wander wherever they wanted their lives were not governed by strict and rigid rules as were the lives that were governed in the mainstream caste based societies now the indian subcontinent has been witness to numerous tribes that have thrived here since ages so many tribes have inhabited the indian subcontinent since times immemorial let us now find out about some such tribes and the ways in which they lived their lives the most important point that we need to keep in our mind when we have to talk about the tribals is that the tribals led isolated lives this is something that we can understand from the point that we just discussed since they lived outside the caste based societies they did not have interactions or communications with the people who lived in the mainstream societies they lived very isolated lives be that in the forested regions or even in the hilly regions now most tribes were dependent on agriculture 
so these tribes were very self sufficient they did not depend on the mainstream societies for gathering the food that they wanted to consume instead they grew their own food crops and consumed whatever they could grow now some tribes that lived in the hilly and forested tracts of northeast and central india practiced a kind of cultivation that's known as jhum cultivation or shifting cultivation let us now find out what this kind of cultivation meant now in shifting cultivation or jhum cultivation large tracts of forests were cleared and the trees were burnt down and after the trees were burnt down ashes were then sprayed all over the soil and when the ashes were sprayed all over the soil and the soil regained its fertility people now started sowing seeds on the soil and the seeds produced huge crops but over time the soil lost its fertility which is why people were compelled to move to different regions now that we have learnt about jhum cultivation let me ask you a question what is jhum cultivation also known as is it known as seasonal cultivation shifting cultivation rotational cultivation or plantation system well the correct answer is shifting cultivation jhum cultivation is also known as shifting cultivation because after a certain period of time when the soil used to lose its fertility the people were compelled to shift to a different place where they could pursue cultivation and let this former tract of land regain its fertility so we have learned that some tribes that lived mostly in the hilly and forested regions pursued shifting cultivation while many other tribes lived by herding and rearing animals now what does this mean these tribes used to herd a lot of animals they used to rear these animals and by rearing different kinds of domestic animals these people used to get dairy products like milk butter cheese which they could use for their consumption so let us now look into the regions where certain tribes lived in india and they spent their lives by herding and rearing animals firstly we begin with the van gujjars the van gujjars lived mostly in the indian state of gujarat as well as the punjab hills and the van gujjars along with the labades who used to live in the present day indian state of andhra pradesh were cattle herders that is to say they used to herd cattle and obtain dairy products from them while on the other hand we have the gaddis the gaddis lived in the kullu region of himachal pradesh this is the present day indian state of himachal pradesh and the gaddis used to live here as shepherds and last but not the least we have the bakarwals the bakarwals used to live in kashmir and the bakarwals used to rear goats so these were some of the tribes that were spread in different parts of india and that lived their lives by herding and rearing animals like cattle sheep or even goats now some tribes lived like hunter gatherers now hunting gathering is a very primitive kind of existence because when human beings were in the earlier stages of development they were not evolved into what we are today they used to live by hunting gathering in this process of hunting gathering these tribes used to hunt the animals that used to live near them and at the same time they gathered different kinds of forest produce like fruits vegetables roots honey which they consumed as food next we move to one such tribe that was a hunting gathering tribe and lived in the present day indian state of orissa and this tribe was the khons so the khons of orissa were hunter gatherers let us now find out how they lived their lives now firstly as hunter gatherers they entirely depended on the various kinds of forest producers that they could obtain 
Now, if you fall sick, your parents take you to a doctor. And then you visit a pharmacy shop from where you get hold of different kinds of medicines that are required for getting better. But where did these people, as in the Khons of Orissa, get their medicines from? Because whenever people leave, it's inevitable that people will fall sick. Well, as hunter-gatherers, the Khons used forest shrubs and herbs for medicinal purposes. So this also tells us how the tribals were at home in the forests. Because these were the forests that gave them their shelter, that gave them their food as well as medicines when they required it. Now as hunter-gatherers, they had sole access to the forested regions in that area. They also gathered different kinds of forest produce like the flowers as well. Now, when people from the mainstream societies required any kind of forest produce, they went to these hunter-gatherers or they went to these tribals who lived in the forested regions. Now, when the weavers and the leather workers who used to live in the mainstream societies required palash and kusum flowers for the purpose of extracting dye, they used to go to the cones of Orissa. And this dye was used by the weavers and leather workers for dyeing the clothes and the leather with which they produced different kinds of goods. Now in this regard, there arises another very important question. From where did the tribals get their supplies of rice and other grains? It would be wrong to assume that the tribals always lived on the fringes of the societies because the societies were evolving and with them the tribals were also evolving. Their food tastes were evolving. Many tribes were no longer having whatever they could only hunt. So they were trying to grow different kinds of food crops which is why the tribals now became dependent on agriculture. But not all food crops could be grown by these tribals. So firstly, these tribals did not have different kinds of seeds that were required for growing different food crops. And at the same time, many of these tribes did not possess the knowledge that was required to grow different crops. So how did these tribals obtain food crops like rice? Because rice forms one of the staple diets of a huge part of the population of India. So let us now try to find an answer to this question. In order to get different kinds of food crops like rice, the tribals were now entering some kind of a barter system. What does this barter system mean? Barter system means a kind of exchange of goods. If I give you something, Suppose I am giving you thing A and in exchange of that you will not give me money but you will give me thing B. So monetary transactions are not involved in the barter system. It's only an exchange of goods. Something similar was practiced by these tribals when they now started interacting with the members of the mainstream societies. So the tribals used to get different kinds of food crops from the people of the mainstream societies in exchange for the forest produces that these tribals had access to. So these tribals exchanged forest produce with the villagers for the food grains that they now needed to consume. Now when this was happening, the demand for more and more forest produce started growing. Because many people lived in the mainstream societies and their demands were also growing. And over time, these people were depleting all the forest producers. So it was difficult for the tribals to get the food crops they wanted because they had nothing to exchange with the villagers. So what did they do? Now the tribals were compelled to do odd jobs in the villages or jobs in the likes of carrying loads or building roads. So in the absence of any forest produce or any kind of good that they could exchange with the villagers, these tribals were now compelled to do odd jobs in the villages. So from this begins the point of exploitation.
because these tribals were people who were mostly illiterate they did not know the ways of the world and for the people who lived in mainstream societies and possessed different kind of resources it became very easy to exploit these vulnerable tribals but some tribals were not willing to give up their autonomy because they did not want to work for others they believed in their own honor they believed in their dignity they believed that they were not meant to serve or work as slaves to the people who belonged to the mainstream societies and in this regard we must mention one such tribe which was the beggars of central india now the beggars of central india lived mostly in the present day indian state of madhya pradesh and they were reluctant to work as laborers because they believed that by working as laborers by working as slaves they would be giving up their dignity they would be giving up their honor they would be giving up their freedom which is something they did not want to do over time these tribals now started becoming dependent on money lenders and traders why is it so this is because people from the mainstream societies were by now introduced to the riches that the forests held they knew that the forests produced different kinds of things which could be of great importance of great value to the mainstream societies which is why they were now trying to encroach into the territories of the tribals now the tribals already did not have money to get any good they did not have sufficient forest produce to exchange for the food grains that they required which is why they now started depending on the money lenders for their subsistence we will now focus on this chain of exploitation that these tribals were caught in at great length firstly these tribals did not have money they were not people who engaged in monetary transactions so in the absence of forest produce they did not have anything to offer to the villagers in exchange for the food grains or other goods that they required but they still needed those food grains for consumption how did they do so at this point it were the money lenders who came to the rescue so to speak the money lenders extended loans to the tribals and the tribals used these loans to buy the goods which were sold at very high prices by the traders because the traders and money lenders had joined hands to exploit these tribals who were poor who were illiterate who did not have any resources but the question that arises in this regard is that the tribals who did not have any money of their own how did they pay back these loans if you take a loan from somewhere if you borrow money from someone you would have to repay that person or you would have to repay that financial institution so in the absence of money how did the tribals repay the loans the tribals were now caught in a very bad and miserable condition why is it so this is because the interests which were charged on the loans were very high the money lenders knew very well how to exploit these poor and vulnerable people because these people did not have the knowledge of economic transactions they did not know how to understand what these loans and these interests were which is why very high interests were charged on these loans and inevitably these tribals found it almost impossible to pay back these loans which is why they plunged into severe debts and poverty they could not pay back the loans but they were having to take more and more loans in order to get the food grains or other items from the villagers which is why they were now enmeshed in poverty it became increasingly difficult for them to survive and earn a living at this point the tribals started considering these traders and money lenders as evil outsiders 
and this now brings us to the idea of the dikus so these dikus were the evil outsiders and the traders and money lenders comprised these dikus so the tribals now realized that it were these dikus who contributed to their misery and sufferings but the tribals at the same time had no way to escape this chain of oppression to escape this chain of exploitation but along with the money lenders and traders there was another group of people who exploited these tribals in very many ways I'm sure many of you know that the Britishers had come to Indian subcontinent in the 17th century and they established their rule over the subcontinent in the 19th century. Now when they came here they also joined hands with these moneylenders and traders to exploit the tribals. So together the moneylenders, these traders as well as these Britishers were considered as the dikus or the outsiders by these tribal populations now over time many of these tribals realized that it became absolutely impossible for them to continue to pursue the former ways of living that they had because shifting cultivation was also becoming difficult for them and in a subsequent lesson we will focus on the reasons why it was so now it also became difficult for them to gather any kind of food crop or any other item from the villagers because the forest produces were also being depleted at a very rapid rate. Now for this reason some tribes now became settled cultivators because they had no other option to earn a living. They had no other option to provide themselves the food that they required for their subsistence. And in this regard, we must mention the Mundas of the Chotanagpur region. The Mundas were mostly concentrated in the Chotanagpur plateau region, which comprises the present day Indian state of Jharkhand. Here you could locate the region where the Mundas were mostly concentrated. Now, the Mundas of Chotanagpur region was one such tribe that became settled cultivators following the coming of the Britishers in the Indian subcontinent. Now, when these people started pursuing settled cultivation, their ways of living also started radically altering because they were now having to settle and stay at one region for a longer point of time. And when they started settling in different regions, they also gained power and authority over the lands where they pursued settled cultivation. Some particular people in these clans gained more power and authority over the rest of the people. And these people now came to be known as the tribal chiefs or the tribal leaders. This lesson introduced us to the ways of living of certain tribes as they lived prior to the coming of the Britishers in the Indian subcontinent. Firstly, we talked about how the tribals led isolated lives. Most tribes depended on agriculture. Some were hunter-gatherers, while some herded and reared animals. Some practiced shifting cultivation while on the other hand some evolved to practice settled cultivation. One thing that we understood from this lesson is that the tribals were not left to enjoy their autonomy and freedom for a long period of time. This is because when the interactions and communications between the tribes and the mainstream societies started increasing, people from the mainstream societies began to exploit these vulnerable people. And this brought us to a discussion on the Dikus who were the outsiders. We also learnt about how the moneylenders and the traders together exploited these vulnerable people and pushed them into a state of severe debt and poverty. And last but not the least, we talked about how the Britishers had also joined hands with the moneylenders and the traders to exploit and oppress the tribals. In our subsequent lesson, we will focus at great length on the impact of the British colonial rule on the lives of different tribes throughout the Indian subcontinent.
Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one to one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step by step solutions and unlimited mock tests. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it's rewarding too. So register for free now.